Hello and good day to all of you. For all of those who don't know me and are new to Kid Stop Press, I am the founder of Kid Stop Press and more importantly, a mom of two. In recent times, whenever we have had a discussion on KSP Book Club on the best books for kids, especially to teach them values about freedom, empowerment, resilience, the Rebel Girl series of books is my absolute favorite. I still remember when I grabbed a copy of Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, I was more excited than my daughters to read it. The following nights were enjoyable as we scoured through the pages, starry-eyed at the stories of each of the achievers, and I have frankly lost count of the number of times we've revisited the books and their series. Today, we're super excited to have Sarah Pervis, senior editor at Rebel Girls and a very famous children's book author. Hey, Sarah, thank you so much for being on KidStopPress.com. And I'm really, really excited for our conversation today because we are both uh, holding this amazing copy and you can put yours up, which is um, the Goodnight Stories, Rebel Girls of Immigrant uh, women who change the world. So very, very excited to have this. And and I've already begun reading it, of course. It's a no-brainer. And my kids are reading. You know what I love about uh, about Rebel Girls is I, I don't know who's excited, the parents or the kids. Do you, do you get that question often enough? Well, I think one of the best things about the entire series is that they are written as good night stories. So I certainly read them anytime during the day. But that means that parents spend that time before bedtime reading to their children, reading with their children. So what we hear is that, you know, they like the stories, they're, you know, they're beautiful stories, they're exciting. I think they're they're beautifully told, but it's also about the time spent together, yeah. uh, you know, which is which is so important. And the kids really crave that and they get it when when parents pick up these volumes. Right. Absolutely. Tell me, did you guys know? Um, you know, when the idea, and tell me, how how was the idea born? Like, how did Rebel Girls come about? Well, it came about, it was born of a Kickstarter campaign in 2016. Uh, the founders of the company were sort of looking around and they were really disappointed with the media landscape. You know, they found something like only 30% of children's books even had girls in them. And, you know, and even of that, it was a much smaller number that were showing girls as ambitious and having careers, um, well, I guess women at that point. Um, and so they really wanted to change that. And they thought, what, you know, how could you, how could you do that? So thus a hundred, uh, the good night stories for rebel girls, the initial edition was born and it tells the stories of 100 extraordinary women who changed the world. And those, those tales of extraordinary women are, um, a really, you know, they cast a really wide net. It was really important to us. You know, we want to be instilling confidence and inspiring girls all over the world. So that means we want to have a real diversity in terms of geography and in terms of the field these women work in and the accomplishments they've done. Some are, you know, on a much grander scale than others. And that's good, you know, to show that there's like a real variety of uh, of things that women and girls can do in this world. Um, It was also important to us to have lesser known people. You know, there are certainly, you know, there there are household names. Everyone knows this person or there are some more up and comers or people you necessarily have never heard of their uh, their invention or their accomplishment until you know until you stumble across them in the books. Right. Did you guys did did they ever know that it would be such? I mean, the founders and of course all of you guys, you know, because I, I believe it's a product of teamwork. Did you guys Absolutely. know at that point in time that this is going to be a movement? Did you know it's going to be so big? It was incredible. I think. Um, I don't think so. Going into it, I mean, I think there was the hope. I think that, you know, people always worry that you're in your own bubble. And so when you're speaking to people, you know, other strong women who are interested in telling these stories, it seems crazy to think that other people don't want to read them, you know, but you need that validation. So starting this Kickstarter campaign and the Kickstarter campaign was wildly successful. And, you know, I mean, how exciting to see, you know, person after person that's willing to chime in you know, and, you know, and vote with their dollars to say, yes, this is a product I want. This is something I want to buy for my daughter, my niece, my neighbor. Um, And, you know, from there, after the first book, you know, we published the the sequel, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls 2, and, you know, and already, you know, reached 10 million girls through through that and a podcast. We did launch a podcast. That's very... How did the podcast idea come about? And, And, you know, which one's your favorite? Well, it's funny. Um, I don't I don't know a ton about the inception of the podcast, um, but what I do know is that they are 
just such a joy to listen to. I mean, they're quite short. They're very, very well done. And they're only, you know, your, your 15, 20 minute stories. So they're more fleshed out than the books, um, but they are still, you know, a relatively quick commitment. So they're easy to work into the days. You can find time as a family, you know, maybe you listen to them together while you're cooking dinner um, or getting ready for school. Um, but it's just another way to work in these amazing stories of like bold, smart, talented women into your child's day. Um, the other thing that's great to mention about the podcast is that they're not just stories of amazing women, but they're stories of amazing women narrated by women that are working today. So for instance, one of the most recent ones, which I absolutely love, is the story of Noor and Ayat Khan. And it's read by Frida Pinto. So, you know, you have people coming to hear it that are excited about the story, but also really excited about the narrator, um, which I think is a really, you know, beautiful kind of synergy since we, you know, we talk a lot about community and fostering a community of girls and the podcast does that. Right. Which is incredible. I absolutely enjoy reading those the, uh, listening to the podcast. Um, tell me, was that, you know, after the first one was such a big success, was the next one, was that pressure for the next one to get that right? Sure, sure. Um, there was. And I think what was um, one of the most special things about the second book is that we took a lot of suggestions from our readers, you know, because that way you felt like people could really be involved. You know, if they were inspired by the stories they read in the first book, they got to really have a voice in who was featured in the second one. Um, and I think that's really exciting. Um, right. Tell me, um, does it, does it always, what, what makes you guys cut, like what cuts through the lens of saying, okay, we have to put this story or this story. How do you decide on who makes the cut? The deciding is both incredibly exciting and totally agonizing because the more you cast your net wide, you know, like I said, we really, you know, we want to have women from countries all over the world. We want young girls, we want adults, we want lesser known, we want household names, we want someone who is, you know, a sculptor and a baker and an entrepreneur and an astronaut, you know, so there are so, and there's so many stories. Um, you know, so we kind of start off everyone in the company and the company is already an interesting and diverse group of people. You have people in, you know, in London and Mexico City and New York and um, California. So we have all of these differing viewpoints and everyone kind of shares the stories as they learn them. So we, in the company, keep kind of a running document of, of these amazing people we've heard of. Um, and then we take a lot of suggestions from, um, from our readers, from parents and from girls who write in. And those are some of the most, you know, charming and inspiring letters you'll ever read. You know, of a young reader who says, you know, I read this book and I loved it. And I think who you should put in the next book is. Um, so yes, yeah, so we go through them all and then it becomes, you know, you sort of, as you fall in love with different stories, you add them to the list and then just make sure you have a really good balance um, that, you know, no one feels really left out. Um, we have kind of a loose categorization that we refer to as our four forces. So we want to make sure that we're showing creators and innovators and leaders and champions, um, you know, and not every leader, you know, that, that doesn't mean you're a politician there. Are, you know, it's a wide definition of those things, but those are kind of um, the forces we want to make sure are, are somewhat evenly uh, covered in the books. Right. Uh, Demi, um, you know, this was a question that, you know, when we put out that we're actually going to be interviewing the team from uh, Rebel Girls, uh, a little girl actually wrote to us, but you only talk about women who are immensely successful. And, you know, uh, so what's your definition of success and what does it take for me to get into the book? And that's a, that's a great question. You know, we do try and show a real diversity of stories, you know, so not everyone, you know, not everyone in the book was recognized at the time they were doing something, you know, and, um, and not all of the, you know, not all success is created equal. Um, and we, we try to address that. I mean, we try to show a, a real variety of, you know, this person I'm um, I'm really enmeshed in the the book that's about to come out that we have not announced yet. So all of the examples that are coming to mind, I don't I can't share with you. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, we just we really try to show because you know 
one of the foundational principles of the company and of the of the books that we're putting out on the podcast is that you know we know that girls suffer a real dip in confidence between like ages eight and 14. So we want to get there. We want to get there earlier than that and during that point to just to to remind these girls that you know they can do anything and they should you know, and that there are role models of all kinds and all different fields out there. Um, and we also want to let them know that you don't have to, you know, win a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, win a gold medal to be, um, to be worth it and to, um, yeah, and to have that confidence and go out into the world and really, really build your community and share what you have. Um, so I hope we do that. I mean, we do certainly hit a lot of stories of like real superstardom. Um, but we, we do aim to, to make it a little more equitable so that girls feel like, you know, not yeah. all. Otherwise, success and. seems like such a mirage that, you know, and, and the definition is so, so, um, you know, is so different to so many different people. Right. Um, and especially as we're moving to people who are more compassionate, empathetic, you know, the definition of really success and impact will keep changing. So I hope the widened net includes people who are making even small ripples in a large ocean. I mean, part of, you know, one of the things I love about the book being so geographically diverse, and I mean, I live in New York City, I live in Brooklyn, so it's, you know, I, I can't make the argument that, you know, someone from my hometown is like a little tiny town being represented, but at the same time, um, you know, I have a real love for the theater community here. And one of the women in 100 Immigrant Women Who Changed the World in, in, this, in this new book um, is Young Jean Lee. And I don't think that she, you know, she's not a household name. Uh, she came to the United States from South Korea as a young woman and or as a child. And she's a playwright. And I don't know who outside of, you know, certain theatrical circles knows that she exists. But I, you know, I happen to have seen some of her shows. And I, you know, so finding someone in the book that you're like, oh, that's, you know, that's my local rebel. <laughs> I yeah. think it's really touching. And also, you know, she, again, she's, you know, she is not a millionaire. She's not, you know, recognized all over the world, but but she is someone who loves to write and found a way to capture stories. And we want to applaud her for that. Um, right. so that's one example that pops to mind. I mean, the new book, which is on immigrant women who changed the world. What probed writing on immigrant women? Like, how did that thought process come about? I mean, I think it's because, because of the world we live in right now. You know, things are changing really rapidly. And there, um, you know, there are a lot of debates. You know, people are, are shouting and screaming about immigration. And, you know, we see a lot of ugliness in the media. And, say, and people, you know, we see a rise of xenophobia in certain places. And to all of us, that's not okay. You know, we'd like to do our small part to um, to tell stories that make um, that you know normalize the idea that this is a global world and we move around and that's okay. And you know, and to to really foster that next generation of people who are totally used to seeing seeing and reading and hearing stories of people that don't look like them and maybe didn't grow up like they did. You know, and just anything that fosters a sense of diverse community. And, and empathy toward others. Um, I feel like that com combats xenophobia in a way that will make the next generation, you know, um, they'll be doing better than we are. Right. Um, to me also currently the book is only in English. Well, we, I mean, historically we've got the first two volumes and with those we have um, 49 mm -hmm. language partners around the world and the book is in 85 countries. Wow. So. The hope is that um, that Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, the immigrant edition, will also have the same amount of success and find its way into all of those countries. So we do, we have a fantastic team who's, you know, whose job is really to work on those deals and, and work with our partners around the world to get it into as many languages and into as many households as possible. Right, which I think is extremely important because the power of this book cannot be only for those privileged reading English, right? I mean, the power of the, the language has to lend itself to, to get into so many other, um, you know, the stories have to lend itself to get into so many different languages, especially local languages, um, because I think mean, these stories are too powerful not to be shared with people. Well, who thank you. <laughs> we um, thoroughly uh, agree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and especially the podcast, right? That's an easier one to convert. Um, so I, mm. I hope. Um, but tell me, you know, in every local country, there are so many local chapters or uh, mimics or 
or inspired versions of the Rebel Girls. Mm. Uh, do you take that as a compliment, or do you do you do you see that as it's okay that the, that that many? I think it's great. You know that I, I think it just um, reminds us that it is a movement. You know, it's not just us battling. <laughs> you know, uphill. I think it shows that there is a real appetite for these books. Um, an appetite for these stories and that and that more people want to celebrate more amazing stories of women and their accomplishments. So so yeah, I think we take it as a compliment of being, you know, we're, we're at the head of that movement um, and we're kind of a, a leading force for this sort of um, children's educational entertainment and audio content that um, that we hope makes the world a, a better place. Right. Um, do you do you get any letters saying that why is it only for rebel girls and not for rebel boys? Do you get that question often? You know, I have never heard that question asked. I think, um, I mean, I am certain, you know, there's always someone, <laughs> there's always someone to write a grumpy letter. So I'm sure it's out there, but it's, you know, it's never made its way to me. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, you know, these studies that show that, you know, girls are only featured in 30% of, of children's books anyway. I think it's, you know, a little, a little bonkers to, to, to be mad that you're not in, in this one. <laughs> right. Um, you know, we're talking of women who are all pre-digital age. If you had a ride on three women you picked um, from, say, the generation after 2000, 2005, who would make the cut? Oh, goodness. I, I think I have to think about that a little longer, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. We, we'd wait, uh, we'll be wait for you to get back to us whenever you can in the future, because I just feel I'm like... So wait, so say that again. So this is, um, so women making change after when? After about 2000, 2005. If you mm -hmm. had to write for anybody then... Uh, who would make the cut? I mean, I think Greta Thunberg, Thunberg show, you know, pops up immediately. Um, I think of Malala Yousafzai. I mean, there are certainly um, young people that are, you know, that are out in the world doing incredible things. So I think, you know, even, even by breaking it down into, um, you know, and talking only about young rebels, which is something we talk a lot about in the company, um, they're still so many to choose from that it's um that it would be hard to pick um oh goodness there's a young woman whose name is escaping me right now but she's an inventor um and she keeps you know she's very young but she just keeps coming up with you know these inventions that are you know that are relatively practical and they're easy to um to to put together but they they make change in their own little ways and like and she's someone that i suspect we will continue to hear from you know for a long time so you know it's just keeping an eye out for stories like that Right. Um, I mean, what's the one thought that all of you guys at the Rebel Girls team would like a young girl who's reading the book before she's going to bed? Think about uh, after reading the book, like what is what is the key takeaway for her that that's like the end vision for you guys? We want her to feel confident and like she is in the, in the company of a great big community of women, that she is 100% invited into that community, um, you know, and that, you know, that of all of these stories that we're telling of, you know, a variety of different accomplishments and, and different hardships and different setbacks and different places that people live, you know, that, that we, we are all connected in some way and that, and that she should yeah, feel confident to go out into the world having big dreams and, and aiming for them. You know, we talk about um, dream big, aim high, fight hard, you know, these sorts of things. And, um, and again, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to be president, but you should do the things you love and do them with gusto and, and never be, uh, feel, feel shame for being a girl or think that you can't accomplish something that the, the boys in your neighborhood can. That's incredible. Um, what's the biggest challenge that you think parents of daughters are facing today when you when you guys are all working on each of the books? What do you think are the biggest challenges that parents are facing? I mean, I think today is a really strange time. Um, you know, I mean, looking at it, say, from the standpoint of we're in the middle of a global pandemic and people are really stuck at home. And I think that can bring out a lot of fears and frustrations. Um, so I think that's one thing. I, I do also think that um, the screen time, you know, screen time is such a challenge and, and what kids are exposed to, 
you know, there's, you know, whether they're, you know, people are being bullied online and, you know, and there is a sense of loneliness or social isolation that can happen. Um, so again, that's part of the reason that fostering community is so important for everyone at Rebel Girls and the stories that we tell, um, because we don't, we don't want there to be the dip in, that dip in confidence and we don't anyone, you know, we don't, um, we'd like to find a way to combat against the sort of nastiness that you can find online, because I think that's a real challenge um, to, to parenting right now. Right. Um, coming to one of the books that you've written, which is How to Start Your Own Business based on Warren <laughs> Secret Millionaire Club, uh, is if we, we absolutely love that. Um, so tell us how about, uh, you know, how, how difficult is it to write for children and what are your, what is it that you strive for when you write for children? I mean, I think um, on a technical level, you know, I look to make sure that sentences are easy to digest, that they're relatively, um, that, they're, that they're short, that there's rhythm, that they're fun to read. Um, and it's funny because I used to think that that was very particular to my writing for children. And I realized more and more that that's just good advice for any writing at all. You know, writing should be, I think, um, fun and accessible. Um, and I, yeah, I think, I think a lot about rhythm when I'm writing for kids because you want to imagine everything can be read aloud. Um, you want to imagine that someone can read it with a smile on their face or that, you know, like I think, um, I think that's, that's part of the engagement is to keep it, keep it light. And, and I don't mean that you don't talk about tough things, but, um, but you don't, you never want the language to get in your way. You want kids to, to understand and enjoy the reading. Um, that's, that's really nice to hear. Um, tell me, being a writer of children's book and being part of the Rebel Girls team, what would your tips be to raise readers? To raise readers? Um, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but young kids, when they're first working on their literacy, when they're learning words, a lot of it has to do, the, has to do with the time they spend with their parents. That's something that they love. So parents can spend the time to sit next to a child, even if the child's doing all the reading on their own and sounding things out. Just physically being there is a good reminder that we're in this together and, and that they get that extra attention that they crave and love. Um, I think, um, you know, reading aloud to your kids is always a great idea. And by that same token, when your kids are ready, encouraging your kids to read to you. You know, there's always chores. There's always stuff to be done around the house. So do them together. You know, those are the times when, you know, you know hey, like I'm cooking dinner. Why don't you read me a story? Or one of us reads while one of us puts the laundry away or whatever. You know, I think there are ways to work in reading all over the place. Um, if there are younger siblings in the house or pets, you know, <laughs> go read, read the story to the dog, read to the cat, um, read to the baby. These are things that, you know, making it a a real family affair and making it fun and, and about a together time is, um, I think, uh, some good ideas. Right. Um, so I think we've, oh my God. Right. And of course, the biggest question that every parent today is fighting is digital distraction and the fact that we're all so distracted, right? Even when you and me sit with a book, we are also sitting with our phone next to it and and then we want to gram a page and then we want to, uh, and then by the time we finish gramming it and captioning it, uh, it's time to hit uh, the bed. So how do you stay indistractable while you're reading and what would you advise to parents? Um, I think a few things. I think if you have a reluctant reader on your hands, um, you know, you just keep trying. I think that you, you never judge if a kid only wants to read graphic novels or, you know, sci-fi stories or, or biographies of sports stars or something. If that's what your kid wants to read, go for it. Don't judge, don't push them to read a million other things because any reading is good. Um, something I love about the Rebel Girls stories is they're all very short. So there's something about being able to dip in and dip out, you know, that if you're, um, you know, it fosters reading while at the same time not demanding that you're ready to sit down for an hour. You know, you could read an hour's worth of stories, but it's also fine if you want to read for five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, we also recommend, you know, we, we love our podcasts. And I think podcasts are kind of a great thing to bridge that digital divide, you know, because if, if someone's not really connecting necessarily with, with reading on the page, they are still being a part of, you know, learning fantastic nonfiction stories, you know, real life stories of real women doing things. Um, but they, you know, so they get the, the education value and, um, 
and the entertainment value, but also it, yeah, it bridges that gap and excites you about good storytelling. Um, and I would throw in one more thing just about storytelling in general, you know, both reading stories and telling stories are so good for children in every way. You know, they, they, um, they foster focus and use of vocabulary and confidence. You know, certainly if you can tell it, stand up and tell a story that is, you know, that those are, those are skills that you will use, you know, for your lifelong. So I always tell parents to like play storytelling games, you know, and, you know, you can even use the characters in Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls as your jumping off point, you know, learn a little bit about someone and then, you know, take, you know, tell stories, make up things, you know, like wonder out aloud how they would solve this problem or what they would do if this happened. Um, but yeah, I think there are a lot of ways to, to, to make reading fun and, and really varied. Um, you know, it doesn't all have to be, you know, heavy or just what's assigned for school. Um, it's okay to read a comic book. Um, yeah. Find yeah. your best and do your best. Absolutely. Um, tell me which is one of, you know, you guys get so many fan mails, so much on Instagram, so much on your podcast, so many comments. What's the one or two that have really, really touched your heart or the founder's heart? And you guys feel like, okay, this has made it all worth it. Um, I think after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, we got, you know, really inundated because, you know, girls were going back and reading her story and they were listening to our podcast on her. Um, and I think, you know, those were the ones where you would get some little girl dressed up as Ruth Bader Ginsburg standing there, you know, holding her book in her arms. Um, those I found really touching. Um, and honestly, it's also a lot of parents writing in and saying, oh, you know, my daughter was never really interested in, in that many books and she can't put this thing down. Um, and those, those are touching because you can really empathize this with the struggle of a parent who certainly wants the best for their child and wants that child to be a, a perfect, great reader from the very beginning. And, and then that's, you know, that's not always the case. Like some, you know, some kids struggle to read or, you know, or have interests different from their parents. Um, so finding... So yes, yeah, so I really, I, I enjoy the joy that you get from the parents that say, finally, we found this thing that we can do together. Um, and I think that's beautiful. Right. Um, incredible. Last question. What's next? What is next? Ah, we have so much going on. Um, so, you know, we have the first three volumes. Um, and so 100 Immigrant Women Who Changed the World just came out in October. And, um, and so we're excited to see, like I mentioned, we have a lot more um, countries and languages to, to share that book in. So that we are busy doing. Um, we have more books coming out um, and we are going to announce some of those soon. Um, but we are expanding, you know, we're really, we are dedicated to, um, to our storytelling and to inspiring confidence in girls around the world. And we want to make sure we are doing that in every way possible. So we have a, we're working on a television show. Um, so stage show um, when, when we're allowed to go to the theater again. Um, but also, you know, we do some live events. We just did um, an event for the International Day of the Girl on October 11th, um, where, you know, we had people, there were sing-alongs and there were dance shows and, you know, and someone taught a, um, taught a like a, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, there was like a drawing prompt that everyone did this art project together. Um, and Oz, Chef Ozma Khan came on and taught people how to make paratha. <laughs> like it was really fun. You know, so we want to keep that up. We want to continue to have these live events. Right now they are live online, <laughs> but eventually we'll all be in the same room, you know, sharing our stories together. Um, there is an app in the works um, and a toy and uh, some merchandise. So, yeah, so we're really we want to we want to take the idea of this, you know, inspiring global edutainment brand um, and, and, and make it bigger and wider. And, you know, and we, the plan is we would, at this point, we've reached 10 million girls and we are committed to reaching 50 million girls worldwide in the next five years. That's incredible. Wish you guys all the very best. And thank you, Dave, thank for you. Taking so much time for chatting with us, Sarah, today. Thank you. It's been fantastic. I really appreciate you having me on. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Sarah, for chatting with us today. And I'm so glad to have met you, of course.
virtually. But, you know, at KSP Book Club, which is our flagship project where we aim to help parents identify the best books for their kids. And any book that helps them inspire and motivate is especially what gets a mention. And thank you for all the books that Rebel Girls brings out because those are the books we love, love, love to read to our children. If you guys love this episode, don't forget to hit subscribe and also sign up for KSP Book Club. We've put the link in the description box below and you can get a newsletter every single Sunday in your mailbox with new book recommendations for your kids. See you guys.